It was a long, cold winter of 1863. The war between the states raged mercilessly. And to Edom, Vicksburg, Gettysburg, Chickamauga, sons, fathers, brothers, from Mississippi to Maine, had not come home for Christmas, and many would never return. One of America's best-known poets, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, a professor at Harvard University, sat in Cambridge, Massachusetts, pondering the state of the world around him, reflecting upon years of despair from the horrors of the war. On April 12, 1861, the opening shots of the American Civil War were fired. And three months later, on July 10th, Fanny Longfellow, his wife of 18 years, was fatally burned in an accident in the library of Craigie House. The first Christmas after Fanny's death, Longfellow wrote, how inexpressibly sad are all holidays. A year after the incident, he wrote, I can make no record of these days. Better leave them wrapped in silence. Perhaps someday God will give me peace. Longfellow's journal entry for December 1862 reads, A Merry Christmas, say the children, but that is no more for me. Almost a year later, Longfellow received word that his oldest son Charles, a lieutenant in the Army of the Potomac, had been severely wounded with a bullet passing under his shoulder blades and severely injuring his spine. The Christmas of 1863 was silent in his journal. But then on December 25, 1864, listening to the church bells pealing forth Christmas tidings, he took up his pen and wrote the poem, Christmas Bells. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old, familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And thought how, as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day. A voice, a chime, a chance sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then, from each black accursed mouth, the cannon thundered in the south, and with the sound the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to men. It was as if an earthquake rent the hearthstones of a continent and bade forlorn the households born of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then peal the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. The tolling of the bells on Christmas Day seemed to lift the heavy heart of Henry Longfellow. It appears that the bells caused him to remember that refrain that's found in the writings of the Gospel of Luke, where we read this. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly 
a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth and goodwill to men. You see, the angel's refrain was in response to the birth of Jesus. The birth of Jesus was good news. It brought joy for all people because Jesus came to save. He came to guide. He came to give us peace. But peace, well, that was something that seemed rather elusive for Henry Longfellow. Not that there wasn't reason. As you've heard, 1861, the war, the Civil War begins, and three months later, his wife's dress caught fire in their home. And um, as she rushed out of the room, the story is told of Henry trying to put out those flames, but he couldn't. And uh, she died. They say that um, Henry Longfellow, if you saw that one photo with his family, he was clean shaven, but his face was burned and he just grew a beard since those days. So he was familiar with tragedy. There wasn't just the war that was without, the civil war that was taking place, and his son, a constant reminder of the tragic consequences of the war. But now there's that war within, the battle to deal with grief and sorrow over the loss of his own wife. So it's no wonder that perhaps you might be tempted to come to that conclusion that just seems to mock the song that there is no peace on earth. However, somewhere in the midst of that day in 1864, when Henry Longfellow picked up his pen and wrote the words, Christmas Bells, he was reminded again that God is not dead. That the wrong will fail and the right will prevail. With peace on earth, goodwill to men. Now, when you think of that story, Longfellow's life is not very different from ours. I mean, our lives are filled with all kinds of mixtures of emotions. We can feel like at times that we're on top of the mountain, and then sometimes you can feel like the mountain is on top of you, right? But peace can often feel rather elusive for you and for me. We chase after it. We take different paths. For some, it might be this path of ambition that we think if we just, if we just rise to this level of promotion and position, then everything will be okay. My life will be made. If I can just have this level of achievement so that the plaudits that come would be enough to quiet any kind of storm within. But sometimes we look for relationships, right? Thinking that that itself might bring this sense of peace into a person's life. And then, no matter what path we take, invariably, it leads around a bend and we're confronted with circumstances that very often are far beyond our ability to control. Sometimes they may be quite severe, like in Longfellow's experience where there's a loss of a loved one, or someone is injured or sick, and you're powerless to change it. Or perhaps, like in Berlin, over this past week, family and friends just going out and living life. And then here they come face to face with the dark side of humanity. And whatever plans they had, whatever kinds of parties and celebrations, those families now 
will forever bear the scars of that day. And so it's tempting sometimes to bend one's head and just sigh and just say, there is no peace on earth. But I, w I want to tell you that peace isn't going to be found in a journey. No self-actualization is just going to arrive at this place of continued peace. And it's not going to be found in achievement, and it's not going to be found in prosperity. I would submit that peace is going to be found as it's elicited here in the praise of those who, on reflection of Jesus, say, there is now peace on earth and goodwill to men. You see, God has always been in the business of reconciliation. Amen. He tells us that he's going to reconcile the world to himself. The scriptures say that God spoke to the fathers through the prophets in many ways and in a variety of means. One of those moments is of particular interest to us tonight on Christmas Eve. Because on one day, there was an announcement of the birth of a Savior that was to come. It was a prophetic word that was given to the prophet Isaiah, 600 years, more than 600 years before the birth of Jesus. You know the quote. It's found on so many Christmas cards. The quote is simply this, that the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and we will call him Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. For this is a sign that the Lord will give. It's kind of interesting. What's the significance of the sign? Well, here's something that you may not understand as the context for these verses. That sign was to be given to Israel of a day when there would come a redeemer. We call the Messiah a savior. Well, that word was given to Isaiah at a time in Israel's history when they themselves were going through a civil war. Their northern brothers were colluding with a neighboring nation called Aram, which in today's geography, it's the part of the country that we know as Syria. So Syria was going to come down this country of Aram would come down, join forces with their northern brothers, and they were about to besiege Jerusalem. And the whole city, the whole, all the southern uh, uh, community was, was just filled with dread and fear about what was going to take place. And so God spoke this word to Isaiah and said, this is not going to happen. He tells them, this is not going to take place. He gives them this word about their present and their future. What he says to them in the present, if you were to go back and read through Isaiah chapter 8, he tells them there that instead of these neighboring nations coming down and besieging Jerusalem, the truth of the matter is that they're going to evoke the ire of a much stronger nation to the north, the nation of Assyria. Assyria occupies the land now that we know as Iraq, those people are going to come down and Assyria is going to wipe out Aram, it's going to wipe out the northern part of Israel, and it's going to take them over. It's forever going to change the landscape. And so in the midst of all of that, God is saying, I am now also going to tell you what I'm going to do in the future. In the future, I'm telling you, here is a sign that I'm going to give you a son, and that son will be God with you. He will be God himself dwelling among you. The text goes on then in the beginning parts of chapter 9 with another familiar verse that you guys know. It's, it's probably on Christmas cards that you've sent out where it says in the text, it says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. We understand the darkness 
to be the fear and anxiety, this loss of peace because of the shadow of death cast by the rival nations. But what is this great light? And why is this light then the sign? Because it's the promise of a deliverer. We know that this promise is going to be fulfilled in Jesus because in Matthew, this is what we read. It says, she will give birth to a son. You are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin shall be with child and give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So this text then that we now read will describe for us who this child is and what he is going to accomplish. Because the text says, for unto us is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That text that adorns many a Christmas card comes in this context of civil war and strife, people afraid, people anxious. There is no peace in the land. They think they're going to be overrun. They think they're going to lose not only their land, but their loved ones. And in the midst of that, this verse is given to remind them that God is ultimately in control. Amen. That what's taking place right now in these rival nations will settle down and God says, I am going to give you this sign of a son. A child is given, a son is born, and the government will be on his shoulders. And the increase of that government and peace, there will be no end. So if this is who this child is going to be and what he's going to accomplish, then let's just look at it for a moment. The word there, wonderful, counselor. The word wonderful is not so much an adjective in Hebrew as much as it is an abstract. It, it's, it really could be translated wonder. And the word wonder throughout the scriptures is applied to the miraculous signs that God has done. It's not what man has accomplished, it's what God has accomplished. So throughout the Old Testament, and in particular throughout the Psalms that give poetic expression to the works of God, it speaks of the wonder of the one who parts the Red Sea, the wonder of the one who gives manna from heaven, the wonder of the one who in the midst of a desert will break a rock and give water to the people of Israel. God is the one who does the work, and all of Israel gives him worship because he is the wonder. But he's also counselor. And in this particular case, the one who is the wonder has no need of other advisors. It's not like he has to put together a team of people to help him make decisions. No, rather we have one who knows the end from the beginning, the one who himself is this counselor. And for that reason, he's one who's able to bring understanding. And so for us, he becomes that wonderful counselor. But he's mighty God. The word God, El, is only applied to the God of Israel. The word mighty is the word heroic. It speaks one who's able to accomplish great things. And so when you read the text, this, the, the text of this mighty God, his name, is signifying that God is going to accomplish great things on our behalf. So I started thinking about that in connection to this prophetic word of Jesus. Why is he going to be such great joy for all the people? Because he's going to accomplish for them what they could not accomplish for themselves. Jesus, on the eve of his crucifixion, in John chapter 16, it's a moment of, it's just a matter of hours before he's going to be betrayed and crucified on a tree for the sins of mankind. But he takes this time, and this is what he says. 
He reminds the people, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. No one of us can say that. We haven't overcome the world. We may have overcome some obstacles. We may have been able to overcome some difficulties. But as I said earlier, there's not one of us who ever is going to follow along this path of life without coming across encumbrances that weigh us down and can give a very heavy heart. But Jesus would say to them, be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. And the implication is that he has gone before us. And because he has overcome the world, we stand in a different position. And so this child that is born, this son that is given, will not only become the wonder of counsel, but he will be God, the hero of his people. Everlasting Father, the word everlasting speaks of perpetuity. It's, it speaks of duration. Oftentimes, again, it speaks of that which is eternal. And now this designated trait is applied to how he deals with his people as a father, one who promises to love them and care for them and provide for them. And so when you look at this title together, you have an everlasting father who will never leave us or forsake us. And all of which then that leads us to the last description of this Messiah, this Redeemer, who is the Prince of Peace. The people were living in darkness and they wanted peace. They felt the shadow of death closing in around them. And they were looking for one who would bring this sense of peace to them. And this child, it says, is not only going to restore peace to his people, but he is going to establish peace in the world. In fact, this child's reign is marked by eternal peace. How are you going to garner eternal peace when there's so much darkness? See, that's what this promise is all about. The promise made to Isaiah in difficult moments was that promise that was appropriated by Longfellow in the midst of his sorrow. And it's the same promise that we're being asked to embrace. The wonderful counselor will offer us wisdom and guidance as we make our way in a world that is broken. But do you have ears to hear? Do you listen? The mighty God proves victorious in the battles that we face within as well as those battles that we face without. But he tells us that he is able there is nothing that can ever separate us from the love which is in Christ Jesus. He is able to do exceeding abundant beyond all that we could ever think or imagine. He has defeated our greatest enemy. He cleanses us from sin. And he changes the human heart. Yes. And here's the deal. If he changes your heart, he changes the world. Amen. Because light dispels the darkness. And one at a time, the world has changed. He is the everlasting Father who promises to be the shepherd, and we his sheep, and we will not want. He'll make us to lie down in green pastures. Yes. He'll lead us beside still waters. He will restore our soul, and he will lead us in paths of righteousness. And even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil for he is with us. And the promise that he makes is that surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The wonderful counselor, 
the mighty God, the everlasting Father, is also the one who is then called the Prince of Peace. What we find is that he alone is the one who grants peace. He reconciles us unto himself. He tells us, he says, do not be anxious for anything, but with prayer and petition, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So he grants peace, a peace that we can never lose. And I hope when you think of Jesus, you think of the one who is able to bring peace on earth and goodwill to men. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the realization that these texts are planted right in the midst of lives not unlike ours today, a world that at times shows itself to be unstable, threats of violence, there's hate, There's a brokenness that's around us. And try as we can to bring this level of peace into our life, it seems that we're constantly confronting the darkness. And yet you tell us that in me, you will have peace. We have peace with God, and we have the peace of God. And one day, all things will be changed. The mortal will take on immortality. That which is corrupted will become incorruptible. The temporal will become eternal. And all things will reflect his reign. It gives us hope, Lord, for the future but it gives the promise of your presence in the present. And I pray that we would be found faithful. I pray that the good news of great joy for all people is what we celebrate in the birth of our Redeemer, the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And we pray this in his matchless name. Amen.